My name is Brian Buffini. I'm the author of The Emigrant Edge, and I'm excited to be with Derek Champagne today to talk about my new book. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. We've got a treat today. We have Brian Buffini with us. He is the author of this awesome new book, The Immigrant Age, How to Make It Big in America. Brian, welcome to our show today. Thanks for having me, Derek. Looking forward to it. I love stories like yours. They're my favorite. They're our listeners' favorites. You dedicated your life to teaching people how to live the American dream. Your experience, you came to this country as a teenager with less than $100 in your pocket you went on to become one of the nation's top realtors and the founder of the largest business training company in North America, Buffini and Company. That's impressive. So fill in the gaps for me. There's, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's incredible. So tell me a little bit. Give me a few highlights and, and where you were at when you came to this country and just what your mindset was. And, and, and let's take just a few minutes from your perspective and give us that introduction. Appreciate it. Well, I, uh, I came to the States when I was 19. Grew up in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, one of six kids, grew up in a little 720-square-foot house, uh, five boys in a nine-by-nine nine bedroom. Hmm. Uh, came to the States uh, at 19, and uh, 92 bucks in my wallet. And I, uh, you know, I came with the mission of uh, getting a suntan and meeting suntan girls. <laughs> and I ended up still being pale, and I married an African-American gal that I've been married to for 30 years. So uh, life doesn't turn out the way you plan. Um, I was doing a bit of work while I was here, selling T-shirts at the beach, doing a bit of painting, which is the family business, and I got into a very serious motorcycle accident. So compound fracture, gangrene, uh, one time they are going to amputate my leg. It ended up leading to 13 surgeries over two years, uh, rods and screws and all of that stuff installed, and so I ended up having to stay. And by the time it was all over, between medical bills and other bills, I owed over $250,000. Mm. So I, I started at the very bottom of uh, uh, American society. Uh, but the thing was, I, I was in America. And uh, if you're going to start at the bottom anywhere in the world, this is the place to do it. So mm. very, very thankful and appreciative of the opportunities I've been given here in the States. I I got a chance. Uh, I did a lot of things. I, I worked in a photo mat. Some of your younger listeners will have to Google that. I <laughs> uh, sold T-shirts at the beach. I was a security guard. You'll love this. I was a security guard with my leg in a cast and two crutches at night at the La Jolla Cove Motel. So hmm. my, uh, my phrase was, if I can catch you, I'll kill you. <laughs> so um, eventually I uh, started meeting some folks who had done real well in business, and a lot of them had either been in real estate or had invested in real estate, and I decided that was the route to go for me. It also didn't require a lot of money up front, so I uh, got into the real estate business, started, uh, got my license, and uh, I mean, I started in the real estate business, honest to God, Derek, I didn't have a car. Um, wow. And uh, I went on my first ever appointment with a, a borrowed car, which was a, a deadhead mobile. Do you remember the Grateful Dead? <laughs> yes. And so this guy was a friend of mine at the time. His name is Mike Taylor. He's actually been my attorney for the past 27 years. But he was a fellow I met at church. And I said, I've got this appointment. I don't have a car. You're supposed to have a car when you're a realtor. Would you mind borrowing, <laughs> loan me a car? And he said, well, I'll give you my son's car. And it was a, a deadhead mobile, a station wagon covered in Grateful Dead stickers. <laughs> the, uh, the driver's side is caved in. Honestly, got held with bungee cords from the driver's side to the passenger <laughs> side. So he came in the passenger side and kind of did the limbo underneath the bungee cords, and away you went. And I, I went on my first ever appointment uh, just like that. But I got a chance to to represent this person and sell a home. Uh, within uh, three and a half years, I was debt-free. Within seven mm. years, I was a millionaire mm. and uh, one of the top realtors in the state of California. By taking care of people and 
just really pouring myself into people and exceeding their expectations. And so, uh, and you being a marketing guy, you know that, you know, the real estate business in the 80s and early 90s, it was it was very much built around like the Wall Street movie. The, the number one trainer at the time had a program called Find Them, Fleece Them, and Forget Them. Hmm. And I had been raised by my grandfather's principles of can you put your name to your work? And that, hmm. um, so I would pour myself into uh, my customers. I do a great job for them. I, I continued to do a great job for them long after the sale was over. So well, if they needed a roofer, if they needed a plumber, if they needed a babysitter, if they, whatever, for as long as they lived in that home, they gave me a call. I was there to help them. Hmm. And so they started telling their friends. And then I put some some uh, marketing behind that. I became a, a personal note writer. I became a guy that would pop by with little gifts all the time and just always trying to exceed the expectations. I'd throw a little party once a year for all my customers. And then uh, they would refer me. And so one thing led to another to, to another. And then the real estate industry puts on a lot of conferences. And they would say, you're doing so well. You're a young man. You had a rough start. Would you come out and share with the audiences what, what you do? So hmm. once a month for two years, I volunteered my time. And I would give back to the industry. And I would just stand up there and I'd say, hey, it's not real sophisticated, but I have a little system for how I make people feel cared for. And how I make them excited enough to uh, to tell their friends, and then they did, and I got a lot of referrals, and they sent me referral after referral. Well, guess what? Then happened, Derek, is people are going, we want to know how you do this, and what's your system, and how do you do this, and how do you do that? So eventually, uh, after a while, I analyzed that situation, and I I started a company to train people, hmm. and then that took off in a way that I never imagined. And now we've trained 3 million small businesses in 37 wow. countries. And today we coach 20,000 small businesses and mm. we have hundreds of employees here in Carlsbad, uh, blessing people all day long. So, you know, uh, the talking head song, uh, where did the days go by and how did I get here? <laughs> I think I just had that experience talking to you. That's incredible. Man, I, I love your story again. The, we'll talk about the book more in a few minutes. You know, for our listeners, his story that he just so eloquently shared, but there's so many, there's so many gaps in between that are small moments too, that are some of my favorite to look at. This book will cover some of those and take you through the journey in a, in a, uh, in, in a longer way and in an even more impactful way than he was able to share in a few minutes. Love, love your, your success story. I got to ask you though, how, what do you attribute to your success? Well, I, I think a lot of things, I mean, um, you know, Faith and family would be a big part of us, right? I think, um, mm. you know, being here in America, you know, one of the things, that, you know, the old phrase, a, a fish discovers water last. Mm. Um, one of the things that happened for me, Derek, was uh, I, I met a, a, an older gentleman in my first real estate office I ever worked at. You know, here I am, I think I was 20. And um, so he says, hey, do you want to go to a seminar? And I'm like, what's a seminar? You know, I mean, it's just like growing up in Ireland, I had never heard of such a thing. And mm. I, I'm going to say this, I'm, you know, I'm, I've become the best of friends with all these Zig and Jim and all these guys, Lord have mercy on them. Mm. But Les Brown and, and the Brian Tracy, you kind of be the last of the Mohicans of those great principle-based motivators. They're mm. in more demand than ever before all over the world. Mm. Not so much in America. Brian Tracy was in here with me last week and... He's in Dubai and Indonesia and Hong Kong and even in Tehran, if you can believe it. Wow. Because the rest of the world is waking up to what's been an American tradition for 125 years, and that is the DNA of personal growth and development. And so hmm. I had this gentleman, Gene Kuhlman, bring me to a success seminar. And I heard Lou Holtz. Hmm. And I heard, um, uh, let's see, who was that? That one, Lou Tice was there. Hmm. Um, Zig was there, Jim Rohn was there, hmm. um, just brilliant stuff. And it, I was like, really? Like these guys were just giving this information out. And hmm. I, I was like, like, I, I was like, a, I don't know what to say. A, a hungry dog runs faster, but I, right. I just couldn't believe it. And these guys are actually telling you how they made it and how they were successful. And, um, I'm like, this is unbelievable. Tommy Hopkins telling hmm. you how to, how to make sales. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. So I went and I started, I started reading these guys and I started listening to these guys. I started going to seminars. I, I started listening to cassette tapes. Mm. Some of your younger folks can Google <laughs> that. And, um, you know, 
and uh, I would listen till I would listen to a cassette until it broke. Wow! And um, I just became I just became enamored with this, and so I found whether it was Norm and Vincent Peale or people like there were pastors in America that were personal growth speakers. Right. And I was like, really? Was like, You've got to be kidding me! And uh, you know, I went up to hear Robert Schuler in the Crystal Cathedral, and I was like, I, you know, I came. You know, I didn't come out of church beat up. I came out of the church three feet off the ground, and I was mm. like, this is unbelievable. So that started in me um, a discipline of personal growth and development that goes on to today. And 30 years in business, you know, I'm more excited about the next 20 years mm. because of who I'm becoming, because what I'm listening to. You know, someone just actually sent me a copy of Don't Buy a Duck. I don't know if you've heard about this book. <laughs> but, you know, I, and I didn't actually, to be honest with you, I didn't put two and two together. I've been doing a lot of interviews and TV stuff. And I started thumbing through Don't, be, Don't Buy a Duck. And I'm like, this is great stuff. And I'm like, that, that's who I am. I'm a guy who's learning. I want to learn from other people. I want to learn what other people know. I want to, and then I, then I do one other thing, which is I apply it. Awesome. And I've tr tried a lot of things. So, I think faith, family, and a commitment to personal growth. And uh, the next thing you wake up and you go, how did I have my own airplane? Well, I appreciate the plug. I don't know who sent you a copy of that book, but I'm glad they did, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it I, was a, a business leader who runs a very, very large company excellent. who said, uh, Brian, I think you'll like this guy. So that just happened two weeks ago. That's very cool. It's a small world, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. so take me back, Ben, five boys in one room. I, I thought I had it bad or good sharing a room with one older brother. Uh, and and we, we grew up similar. What would, I mean, you, yours is a, a much bigger story, but I, I had dirt road, no, t no cable TV. No, you know, we, we just, mm -hmm. we, we made our own opportunities and, and I, I love your story. I really connect with it. Yours is on steroids. Tell me, I mean, it seems like you always have this upbeat attitude and you're always looking ahead and things are positive. I want to know some, are there some memories that you can point to that can be small moments that are just some of the most satisfying along your journey? And it doesn't have to be a big moment. Like what are, yeah. what, what's a moment or two that stands out to you that said, wow, this is, I'm really growing here or this, or we're achieving. It doesn't have to be your first plane, but what's something that happened well, yeah. for you that you really remember? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think as you would know this, Derek, I, I think the big things are usually the small things. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, the biggest things for me, unless you find your identity and stuff, then you're looking for the big things. But I, I really think the small things come along. I remember, so here I was, I was 19 years of age. Well, when I got hit on the road, uh, you know, I didn't have medical insurance. I didn't know what medical insurance was. Hmm. Um, I came from a country where, you know, there was limited opportunity. It was heavy on socialism. It, but it, if you got hit on the side of the road, you were taken care of, you know. And so right. I, I got taken to an ambulance. Uh, I was brought to a hospital, Mission Bay Hospital, my bone sticking out of my leg, my helmet was split in two, they thought I'd broken my neck, and they go, do you have medical insurance? And true as I'm sitting here, you know, 40 minutes later, and they stabilized me, in fairness, now I'm not, this is not throwing anybody on the sure. bus, they stabilized me, made sure I was okay, but they put me back on the ambulance, and they took me to UCSD Medical Center, and I was on the seventh floor in Ward 7, and that was the place where they treated the, 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 the prisoners from the local hospital hmm. who were having surgeries and whatever. Now, maybe they thought, you know, an Irishman would fit in with the prisoners well, and they'd be <laughs> part of a community type thing. Right. But, um, you know, I remember being there, and I remember being, you know, at the very mercy of everything. And I, and I didn't understand the American bill collecting system. I didn't understand having a Social Security number and your credit score. So over the course of the next 18 months, all of a sudden, I'm getting bombarded every hour of the day. Hey, you owe us for this. You owe us for that. I used to have all the bills. I would. I rented a room in this little old cottage, and I had a big, thick mantelpiece. Remember the old fireplace, big, thick wooden mantelpiece? Yes. And when the bills came in, I would put them at the back. And when they fell off the front, that's when I opened them and read them. I, <laughs> I've always been very systematic. <laughs> and so I, I, I couldn't do anything about it, Derek. You know, I just, but that's when I decided to read them. And I remember, so the first moment was earning a few bucks to pay off the most voracious of the bill collectors and then getting the next one. Well, I remember, I remember the day, maybe, maybe one of my greatest moments of achievement I've ever even enjoyed. I remember the day when I paid the last of the envelopes off the mantelpiece. Hmm. And I did it through hard work. I did it through serving people. I did it. And it, it took me a long time. It took me, you know, almost two and a half, three years to get debt free. Hmm. Um, but I would say this, that's what led me down the road. And I, 
what I did was I increased my earnings, Derek, but I kept my expenses the same. So three years after that, I'm a millionaire. Mm. And so that's why years later, when the opportunity comes up to be a speaker and presenter, I went on the road and I didn't have to make money. I, I, I didn't need someone to buy into me and spend four hours selling them something. I could just serve. I could just serve and I could give it and I could give it and I could say, by the way, if you like what I have, come along. And a great little example here, I wasn't planning on talking about this, oh, but when I came out on the, on the speaking circuit, in the real estate business and the lending business at the time, a person would put on a four-hour seminar and they'd spend three hours and 50 minutes selling stuff to the audience. Mm. And the typical speaker would sign up 8% of an audience to buy their stuff. When I came out, I would do a two-hour and 15-minute seminar I would spend six minutes at the end saying, hey, I have this other program to go to if you're interested. And 42% of the people would sign up. And I wow. maintained 42% of every audience I presented to signed up for our programs for the next 17 consecutive years. Wow. And by, by giving, by giving more, by giving value, by being respectful. And then, by the way, I mean, also being... Uh, uh, being an advocate and being a marketer and saying, by the way, I have this next step if you're interested. Hmm. And here's what I did. I built a coalition of people who are interested. You know, uh, we now have a coaching program. I have clients who've been with me for 21 years, wow. hundreds of them. Wow. And so uh, it kept building, it kept building, it kept building. So, you know, it sounds old fashioned. It sounds a bit trite in the, in the world we're living in today, but genuinely serving people, genuinely caring for people, hmm. genuinely giving more than you're getting paid for. And then ultimately asking people to do business with you. And, and some people forget to do that. Some people are great at serving, but they forget to ask, right? That's why mm. we need marketers like you. Um, but giving and giving and giving. And um, it's the law of the harvest. And the more you sow, the better you're going to reap. I love it. I, let's, let's, let's turn and talk about the book. You, you talk about the traits that help you prosper. I'm really excited about this book. Again, I love learning from, from people who have been in the trenches and have, have, have pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and have, have found their own way and, and doing the things that you've done. You're my favorite type to learn from because it's, just, it's an incredible success story and it's so real and personal. And I think so many people can relate to it because you, you're the every person. You're the person that came out and you didn't have everything handed to you and you had obstacles along the way but you persevered and you continue to and you always see opportunity in helping others and I love that this book again The Emigrant Edge uh, it's endorsed by guys like Dave Ramsey and Joe Furman who's a New York Times bestseller of Eat to Live Jack Canfield the, the co-author of, of uh, New York Times number one bestseller Chicken Soup for the Soul the Success Principles and so many others so tell me a little bit about the book what what is The Emigrant Edge well so imagine this I'm 30 years in the States um living the life of Riley, as they say in Ireland, right? <laughs> and I, I, I see a report from uh, the Harvard Institute of Politics, and it said that 50% of millennials believe that the American dream is no longer attainable. Mm -hmm. And then I read a second report that said 50% of baby boomers believe that their kids will not have as much opportunity as they've enjoyed. And when you're an immigrant and you come from the place like I have, like so many thousands have, that, that's kind of a shock to the system to hear that. Um, and not and everyone's entitled to an opinion, but but those opinions are, are those are their feelings. But it's just not true. It's not even close to being true. There there will be five times the amount of millionaires made in the next fifty years than there were in the last fifty. No question about it. And we have data. We have projections. We have GDP forecasts. We have all those things. But at the end of the day, if you believe that you can't be successful, if you believe that the American dream can't be attained, then you won't even bother dreaming. And so. Uh, I have been blessed beyond belief. You know, as you know, there's a lot of people in my world, they'll write a book and then become a speaker. I, I spent 22 years on the road and then finally wrote a book. And it's interesting how that's worked. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a household name except in my niche. Um, and, you know, we hit the New York Times bestseller list the first week out because we've been blessing people for a long time. But I want to reach people that, that I don't know and to encourage them. And I, I so the first thing was, you know, the... I decided, what are the principles that not only made me successful, but dozens of the Fortune 1 and 500 companies that were founded by immigrants? Uh, there is just tons of people in the Forbes 400, richest people in America and in the world, who are themselves immigrants. And so I started with my research team, breaking down all the characteristics of all these people who came here with nothing and made it big, because 
if you can come here with nothing, maybe don't know the culture, the language, how things go, how business works, and be successful, then anybody can do it. The, the second thing that inspired me, Derek, is, I don't know if you know this, but uh, for the last hundred years, the number one hobby in America has been gardening. And it just got surpassed by ancestry study. People research in their ancestry. And the, uh, the Internet, since the World Wide Web became what it is, uh, there's been one search that was the number one search. And it's, it's not the cleanest and uh, <laughs> most wholesome search, if you know what I mean. Right. That just got surpassed by ancestry research. Wow. And so, so here's the deal. I said, we have a whole bunch of people who don't believe the American dream is possible. There's a whole bunch of people who believe their kids are not going to have as good opportunities as they did. And yet they're all researching their ancestry. And I thought to myself, what if we could put the two things together? And we could have, because here's the thing. You know the name Champagne did not originate in Arkansas. You know that for a fact. <laughs> right. And you know there's someone in your DNA who left everything they know, who left every one they know, mm. and, and risked everything to start a new life in a new land. Right. And their hope and prayer was that their kids, their grandkids, their great-grandkids, down into generations in the future, would have a better opportunity than they did. And somebody paid a huge price for mm. you to be sitting in this show here today, right? Absolutely. And so the, the thing is, what if people could tap into that DNA, what if people could tap into that spirit that's actually part of their own heritage, along with the opportunity that this country affords, and then go follow some principles that have been tried and true by people who had nothing, and then go on and succeed. And so that's, that's what originated the book, and I broke it down, my own journey, and many, many other hundreds and hundreds of hugely successful people uh, who came here with nothing into seven traits that you can apply no matter where you were born. It's incredible. I, I love it. I love the whole concept. One of the traits you discuss is a voracious desire to learn. You urge mm -hmm. people to upgrade their input. What do you mean by that? Well, again, one of these guys I went to here was the great Jim Rohn. Hmm. And uh, I got a chance. I stood in line. I'd never met somebody like this before. I stood in line. I bought his book. I had him sign it. He heard my accent. He said, where are you from? I, we just exchanged for a few minutes. And he said these words to me, and he said it on stage, but he looked me in the eye and he says, Mr. Buffini, if you'll work harder on yourself than you do on your job, you'll go from making a living to making a fortune. Mm. And I went, wow, that, I'd never even thought about working on myself. Mm. And then I started reading and, and doing a bit of work. I, ben Franklin, America's first millionaire. His favorite quote from himself was, if a man will take his purse and invest it in his head, it's the investment that pays the greatest dividend, and no one can ever take it away from you. And investment in knowledge is the greatest. And so uh, if you watch Being Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. Warren Buffett has all these degrees and all these honorary degrees. He only has one certification hanging up in his office, and it's a 10-week Dale Carnegie course. Wow. Because he said he got the confidence to speak in public. He asked his wife to marry him, and he's used those principles every day of his life. Mm. So this voracious openness to learn. And so when you put the good stuff in, and that's what's so amazing, uh, Derek, you know, look at it. Here, if someone like you writes a book about marketing. Somebody's trying to get the ball rolling. As you and I both know, most small businesses fail because they do a terrible job of promotion and marketing. Right. And so you read your book and you get a couple of great ideas and you go implement it. Bang. Boom. And then, then you read the next guy. And then you read the, the guy he learned from. And then you go to a class. And then next thing you know, and it's, it's who you're becoming. Mm. It's who you're becoming. And so for me, it's a lifestyle. For me, personal growth and development for the past 30 years has been something like breathing. I, I do it every day. You know, I, I, I don't. over. I, get, I do very little social media. I'm out there, but I'm not living on it all the day. Mm. Uh, I do very little news media. Now, I, I have research, and I'm forecasting markets for my clients, but I'm not caught up in all of the stuff every day. You know, I'm more likely to be listening to Earl Nightingale's Strangest Secret from 1956 mm. than I am what's going on in the Situation Room at CNN. Mm. And so that's the stuff that fuels me. That's the stuff that has me on fire. You know, I'm, I'm 50 years of age. I'm getting ready to be a grandpa. And I'm more fired up today than I've ever been in my life. I haven't needed to work for 15 years, but I'm more excited about my business than I've ever been. And it's because I keep learning. I keep putting the good stuff in. And I watch people and I observe people who've been learning for years and years. And so I, they're role models for me, and I'm just following in their footsteps. So I think it's the first step. If you will have a voracious openness to learn, 
It means you're humble. It means you're open. And now you can bring into your life everything that you need. Thank you so much. I love that. Congratulations on, on having a, a grandchild on the way. Yeah, thank you. I, I love that what you said, who, are, who you are becoming. Mm-hmm. And I feel like so many of us, and I'll include myself many times, how impatient we get. And we want to have arrived. And I see so many. We have a lot of wonderful young people that work for us. We see others that come in. They want the title right away. And, and yep. they want that position. And, and, and I'm not saying entitlement, but they want the title. And who you're becoming, here you are. You've done all these things. You, you continue. You're hungry. You don't have to work 15 years. And, and you continue to say, I'm learning. And I love that mindset. I think that's so critical, who we're becoming, mm-hmm. who we continue yeah. to evolve to be. And I think the next the next point, you know, in the book is this do whatever it takes mindset, which flows out of once you're open to learn, you take the stuff in, then it's I'm going to do what it takes. Mm-hmm. And one of the dynamics we feel today, and again, you kind of touched on it, you know, we have this creeping sense of entitlement, mm-hmm. you know, creeping into the culture. And one of the ways you can tell entitlement, two ways to me is one, when you hear what we complain about, mm-hmm. and when you're complaining, it's because you think you're entitled to something. And the second thing is how quickly we are to give up yeah. and not persevere through. Well, one of the gifts an immigrant has, you're like the Walendas, and you've got no safety net. Mm-hmm. So when you face a problem, you're going to figure it out, and you're going to do whatever it takes. And that's what – it's with an ethical process of do whatever it takes. It's not, right. oh, by all means, necessary Machiavellian. It's, I come to an obstacle. Okay, I'm going over it. Nope, can't go over it. I'm going under it. Can't go under I'm going to go around it. Can't go around it. I'm blowing it up, and I'm going through it. <laughs> but – we are just do whatever it takes. And, and let me give you an example, because I don't want people to get a false impression of me. Oh, this guy's never had a bad day in his life and everything he's done touched the gold. So think about it. For, for uh, 18 years, we were the best in brand in the real estate and lending space. Now, today we have 47 different types of industries we serve. But we were realtors and lenders because that's what I came out of. That's who we coached and served. Hmm. Well, we ran in 2007 into the largest worldwide economic dur- downturn since the Great Depression, right. that was centered in real estate, Derek. Wow. And here's what happened. The real estate mar- market went down 32%. That's what led to the Great Recession and then the mortgages that were built around that. Far worse in our industry because we lost far more than 32%. First of all, we lost 40% of the participants in the industry. Those are my clients. And then of those that were left, they were making 57% less. Wow. So... Our industry went down 87% of the amount of revenue available in our industry. I had 27 competitors at the time. Wow. And so it's do whatever it takes. And now I'm married to, thank God, I married a Southern gal. <laughs> she was on the U.S. Olympic uh, volleyball team. Wow. Uh, I like to say she couldn't qualify for the Irish team because her blood alcohol level was too low. You know, we wouldn't take her, you know. <laughs> but um, the bottom line is, here's what we did. We said, whatever it takes. So we started selling off large amounts of our own personal real estate, commercial buildings, residential. We had a house for all of our six kids. Each kid had a house as a kind of a dowry. We sold all those houses. We sold tens of millions of dollars worth of real estate, had to pay taxes on them and sold them in the bottom of a market to write giant paychecks to keep our business open every month. Hmm. Do whatever it takes. Now what happened? It took that, that recession was deeper and longer than everybody thought. The banks who I was supposed to be dependent on, they all bailed on me. But we had to do whatever it takes mindset. When the recession ended, here's what happened, Derek. There were 26 of our competitors were no longer in business. Wow. The marketplace and our customers said, you guys were there for, during the tough times. So when the market picked up, we were the first company they came back to do business with. We have triple the market share that we used to have before we went into the recession. And I would just say it's so I don't want people to think, you know, this is this will be a handy habit for me, a trait for me to have 20 years from now The do whatever it takes mindset, voracious openness to learn. Life happens. Recessions happen. Bad health challenges come, you know, challenges in relationships, challenges in in your in your industry. You know, Amazon just bought up your competitor, whatever it is, right. you're going to face it. Voracious openness to learn, do whatever it takes mindset, you're well on your way. I love that. And, and the word mindset is so important. I, I was reading a book recently that quoted, uh, behind more mountains, behind a mountain is more mountains. 
And so mm-hmm. you're going to face more challenges. Mm-hmm. It's going to, it's going to happen. And it's the mindset that gets you through. And, you know, you, you could have had a different outcome with your business at that time. And you, sure. I believe your story would still be similar today. It would just be different circumstances, but you would still have a mindset of what you did with those other circumstances and how you were successful coming out of it or what you learned from it and were successful in your next venture. And so that I book that you're reading, is that, uh, is that Carol Dweck's book on mindset? Yes, it is actually. Yes. Sure. Yeah. It's See, great. like, we're all, we're all, you obviously have the openness to learn. We're all reading from the same hymnal and we're all growing, right? That's right. And, it's, and, and that's so, and that yeah. thread is so important. It lets us have real big conversations that are meaningful uh, when we start to open up that way and be continuing to learn. Hey, I've got a mm. few more questions for you. I want to ask sure. you about, uh, I've actually been reading another book about gratitude recently. You talk sure. about, you emphasize the importance of gratitude. And, and I felt like, and I was going to say it earlier, uh, it seemed like the thread in your story did have a, a, a theme of gratitude to it. You're talking about being in a small house. You're talking about paying off some medical bills. You're talking about growth. And there didn't seem to be any kind of woe is me at all. You seem to have had a healthy outlook on gratitude. How does gratitude help us succeed in life? Well, I think a lot of people, you know, view attitude, especially in business, as kind of a namaste type thing. You know, that that's mm. a nice thing. It's a little woo-woo. I mean, obviously, it's nice to be pleasant and so on and so forth. I believe there's seven traits in the Emigrant Edge. If, if you know, if I'm pushed to have a favorite, number four, a heartfelt spirit of gratitude is the one. And I believe it's – I'll tell you what I how I think. It's like having a supercharger in your car. It's like your car is driven by – you know, aviation fluid or, or rocket fuel, and everyone else is just in diesel. Mm. Um, you know, and this is not my idea. There's nothing new under the sun, as you know, Derek. It's just how we package and present right. for our time. Cicero said, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, it's the parent of all others. We always talk about growing our character and becoming who we can be. Virtues are what they used to refer to as character qualities and character traits. Gratitude, to me, is the most powerful uh, fuel that you can access as a human being. Hmm. And it starts, you know, for us with our six kids, we started with their, when they were kids, you know, please and thank you, not optional. Before they could speak, we taught them little sign languages of please and thank you. Um, hmm. After every meal, after everything, it's please and thank you. I, I wrote in the book, we go to restaurants and the waiter or waitress, your kids are amazing. And th- now here's the thing, here's what they'll say, Derek. They'll say, your kids are amazing. Hmm because they said please and thank you. You know, there was a time when people wouldn't say your kids were amazing because you said please and thank you. So here's what it means. That type of gratitude, that type of expression of gratitude is, is so rare today that it stands out so far amongst the competition. <laughs> Before I had a plane, I would get upgraded all the time. Not trying to get upgraded, but the, the flight's 50 minutes late. I'm giving good energy to the to the the gal behind the desk and she's doing her best and I'm giving her good energy. I'm like, hey, thanks for all you're doing. I appreciate it. Next thing you know, Mr. Ruffini, can you come to the desk, please? Hey, we have an opening on first class. Would you mind if we upgraded you? Mm-hmm. Um, I can give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of that. Now, here, here's the thing. I, well, I was starting as a young realtor. I saw an interview with David Dimbleby and he interviewed George Bush Sr. And so here was a guy that was a war hero. Here was a guy that became a, an oil magnet. Here's a guy that became the director of CIA. Here's a guy that was the vice president of the United States for eight years, the president of the United States for four years, two sons that were governors of the two largest, amongst the two largest states in the country, and one of them went on to be presidents. Now, I don't care what anybody's politics are. Right. If you just look at that throughout history, you go, that's a guy I might want to hear from. Right. So David Dimbleby said, what's the one thing you've done in your life to be successful? And his response was instantaneous. And he said, David, the one thing I do every day when I come to the office is I write at least 10 personal notes of people who I came in contact with the previous day or people who came to mind. And he was living in a very large White House at the time, and I was living in a very small White House. So I started that when, you, when people at the top of the ladder tell you what they do, do it. Right. I, I'm, I'm Irish. There is no Irish space program. And we're pretty simple characters, you know. <laughs> I mean, God created alcohol to stop us taking over the world. I mean, the bottom line is, when a, a very successful man says, I write personal notes every day to thank people, I took it on board. You bet. And for 31 years, I've written personal notes. I already, about, I did about 20 this morning, mm-hmm. and I've done, I've done three broadcast shows today. Wow. The bottom line is, it is powerful. And by the way, the feeling of gratitude without the expressing of gratitude is the same as ingratitude. Hmm. 
And so I thank people. I appreciate people. I have hundreds of employees today. Uh, yesterday we had a meeting. Guess what I did? I wrote a note of thanks in a book, and we gave it to every one of our staff. People loved it. They walked through brick walls for me because we appreciate them. We thank them. Our, we teach our clients to be the people of gratitude. Thank your customers. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for giving me a chance. Uh, I, thanks for the opportunity to serve you um, constantly. And so guess what? Our company today produces 10 million personal notes a year that our clients buy from us to go wow. send to their customers. Wow. So gratitude's a big business, Derek, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's the law of the harvest. And if you give out gratitude, it changes your attitude, but it also changes the attitude of your customer. And in today's world, it makes you stand out amongst the competition. So mm-hmm. to me... I'm glad you picked it out, but to me, the heartfelt spirit of gratitude is, uh, is it's a, it's a nuclear weapon. It's so powerful. You know, I'm, I'm really, again, I want to give a plug for the book. And, but before I do that, is there, is there one thing you want to, last thing you want to share with the audience that they can take away today to begin their journey to success? Well, I think this, you know, there's an old phrase that says faith without works is dead. You know, you've got a great show here, and you're bringing great information, and you've done, you know, uh, you're bringing great people in. I you had Tim uh, Sanders on here the other day. He's a good friend of mine. and You're bringing great people to your audience. The key is don't just be a listener. Don't just be a passenger. Don't think this stuff is just for somebody else. Take it and do something with it. Hmm. You know, you heard the idea about personal notes? Just try it. You heard about being grateful to a waiter or waitress? Just try it. Go do something with this stuff, and what will happen is, You'll hear a few ideas, and you'll keep showing up. You'll you'll read one or two of these books, and you keep showing up, and some of them are going to change your life. That's a fact. Mm, So powerful. And New York Times bestseller now, correct? Yeah, very thankful for that, too. Congratulations. Yes, that's something to be be very grateful for. Uh, Brian Buffini, thank you again. I'm honored that you came on our show. I want to plug this book again, The Immigrant Edge, available uh, Brian, where where do we find your book? Where can our listeners find your book? Well, it's all everywhere books are sold, right? I mean, nice. Audible, you know, Kindle, wherever you want, Amazon, bookstores. Uh, I like doing it in the bookstores because I like supporting small business. Yeah, but okay. um, awesome. Uh, Everywhere you get a book and, and read it and listen to it, and I hope they enjoy it. I'd love to hear their feedback. This book is highly endorsed. It's a New York Times bestselling book. You've heard Brian today. I encourage you to go out and check this book out, uh, do some more research on Brian as well. And this, this Immigrant Edge and the, the seven traits he shares and just the story of his personal story and success uh, and what he's learned on the way is so powerful. Brian, thanks again, and I look forward to the great following the great things that you continue to do. Great to meet you, Derek. You too. You take care. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be.